Hassan, Zach, Angeli, Corbin Angeli, and then Don from Don's Pinball Podcast. And as uh, it was alluded to, we are here to talk about marketing to new audiences and the power of pinball. Um, pinball is at an all-time peak right now. More people since the pandemic are into our hobby than really have ever been before. But we need to continue to grow that. So how do we do that as distributors, hobbyists, operators, and podcasters? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit. So before we get started, the first thing I want to do is definitely thank Mr. Burke for inviting us. Um, this is definitely, you know, a peak honor for us to be able to be at basically the, you know, the top of the mountain. So thank you, Mr. Burke. Can you hear me now? So how do we attract new audiences? Like, how is it done? How are we not just always regurgitating the same 30 people through that are, are hardcore pinball people? Um, we have five basic things that we do. Social media marketing, pop-up events, advertising and being in pinball adjacent spaces, collaboration, and community. So we're just going to go through each one of those quickly. So social media marketing, that's probably me and Don more so than the other three. Um, social media is just, <laughs> it's at the apex of how people communicate, how people get information, how people interact with you. Um, Don and I both just create daily, if not hourly, content for people to engage with. You know, interacting with the followers, having reliable and unique uh, scheduled events that they can interact with, and then building a community. Don, did you want to kind of piggyback on that a little bit? Because that's really a huge part of what you do. Hello now. Oh, there you go. Guy. What's up, everybody? My name is Don Garrison. I run and started Don's Pinball Podcast this year. And I, yeah, a little tinny in the back. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm a regular consumer of the same kind of content that I'm putting right back out there. And so I want to just kind of give back to the community that has given me so much to listen to when I'm mowing the yard, walking the dog, making up excuses not to do the dishes, and, and so forth. Um, so January of this year, I decided, dang it, I'm going to do a podcast. I got the mixing equipment. And then I put together a little bit of a plan to try to really, you know, launch this thing in the best way possible on the hopes that it would be maybe successful. And it's already exceeded all of my expectations. Um, I did that by building, um, you know, my Facebook page first. I made sure I had a, 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 a Gmail account that was also linked to that, a YouTube account, placemarked, everything was ready to go. I went on the website Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, and it's just full of freelance artists from around the world that do great art, uh, music, images, whatever you need, social media packages, and for, you know, 30 to $60, I had banner graphics made in much better detail than anything I could come up with. Um, I sent them some sample uh, photos, and they did uh, illustrations for me, and that's now um, kind of the logo for the podcast on Spotify and everywhere else that's available. It's on the Facebook page. It's on the YouTube page, so it was all consistent, and then I launched all that simultaneously with my first episode, and then I do 20 to 30-minute episodes episodes two to three times a week because the news, man, it just keeps coming. And so I'm able to stay relevant like that. And, um, you know, I'm always on you know, Facebook or Instagram and kind of following these people and the, the media makers. And now I just kind of moved right into that same space. And what I hear back from people that travel, you know, as far away from the, the, the frigid north of Canada to come visit me, um, they like that uh, <laughs> consistent exposure, you know. Um, attention spans are short, and there's always something to turn to rather than wait, you know, for a monthly update to try to recap everything that happened during that month. So, um, you know, just it doesn't have to be a lot, but it just has to be somewhat consistent to stay in that zeitgeist space. Yeah, Don's absolutely right. Consistency is key. People, you know, have an expectation of being able to see your content on a regular basis, interact with you. If they're commenting, you're responding. All of those things um, make people feel like they are a part of, of the community that we're building. So Corbin, Zach, Kyle, and I, a big portion of what we did early on uh, were pop-up events. Literally pinball adjacent spaces. So not these places where you would expect pinball to be, but places where we think that people who will love pinball will be. Is that a brewery? Is that a comic book shop? Is it a record store? Is it a music venue? And we started doing interesting things. Hey, James Bond is coming out. Let's get every version of James Bond together and do a Bond party. Hey, costumes? 
all of them, everything from the Gottlieb timed version to the GoldenEye Sega, all the way through to the Bond 60th, we put them all together, and you got people coming out that were James Bond fans, and now they're engaging with pinball. So that's what we're looking to accomplish in those spaces. We're looking to bring people into it who we think will have a possible future interest in pinball. So we did another one at a, a music venue. Uh, Corbin's family has, what's the name of the venue, Corbin? The, it's an oracle. the Oracle, that, it's in, oh, I think it's this one, okay. Yeah, The Oracle, it's a music venue in uh, our town, local hometown, and uh, we, we did a pop-up event there, and now we actually have, there's two permanent pinballs that are there all the time, and people follow it, you know, they, they find out, oh, there's an Elvira there, there's a getaway, let's go play it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely, these opportunities to then not only do the pop-up event, but then the venues recognize, oh, there are a bunch of people out there who are interested in playing these games. Let's talk to the operators or maybe buy some of our own machines to put in here, and then you're just growing pinball. You're just constantly, constantly growing. But music venues, breweries, festivals, we did the Cleveland Gaming Convention. Um, you want to talk done, about? Uh, tattoo conventions, too. Tattoo we've done conventions. Tattoo conventions uh, where we've done pop up arcades, arcade games, and pinballs. Well, okay. Yep. Tattoo conventions, other things like that, uh, Comic Cons, anywhere, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, my wife runs a hospital, and they were doing a uh, an employee event, and Corbin's family brought down a bunch of pinball machines and arcade games. And again, it's just getting these games out in front of people and making them realize or having them realize these are still being produced, these are out there, these are to be enjoyed. Yeah, weddings too. Yeah. We did, we've done a lot of like that weddings bridal showers anything that you know if there's people there and they want to play pinball let's let's get the pinball there absolutely it's it's that you just have to be willing to move pinballs i think that's <laughs> the key yeah <laughs> more not enough sense in uh truck so you'll be good to go <laughs> so how did we all come together i mean pinball can be a community it can also be very divisive there are some personalities and some people out there distributors, um, podcasters, you know, YouTube content creators that are just in it for themselves and they're not interested in really the growth of our awesome hobby. That's the opposite of who the five of us are. We are all about More collaborating. Pinball. More pinball is good for everyone. So we've collaborated together. In addition to that, we've worked with the Electric Playground who builds toppers for events. Um, we've worked with other distributors. Oh, I know that's like the dirty word. Like, why would you guys are competition? Why would you ever work together? It, we work together for the good of everyone. It's all about collaboration. collaboration. Yes. I mean, Zach and Corbin can tell you. I mean, the operator perspective a lot of times for years and years and years was, hey, you know, it's only good for me, only what's good for me. And they've been so awesome about working with other operators, splitting locations and working together with a lot of those things. I mean, Rob Fowler from 216 Pinball, you guys, you know, share some space and do some things. And it's just, it's good for everyone. Shout Dark. out to 216. Yeah, oh, definitely man. shout out to 216. Now. I mean, Darkroom Pinball photographer and video comes out and shoots our events. Look up Darkroom Pinball. You won't be sorry. Oh, my gosh. If you're on Instagram, Darkroom Pinball, John, he is unbelievably talented. So other partners, obviously Mr. Burke, he has, you know, Pinball Expo. He has the amazing in Gerard, Ohio, Pastimes Arcade. Um, he's been a huge supporter of everything pinball bef before it was cool and before it was popular. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, that is... And that's the thing, is when you're at the top of the mountain, when things are going well, everyone wants to be a part of it, but the people like Mr. Burke, who were you know, keeping things on life support for so many years, that's, that's what gets us where we are today. So community, uh, Corbin already hit on a little bit, talking about weddings, receptions. Um, I mean, we'll travel to, uh, we went to the Vintage Flipper World in Ann Arbor. They, <laughs> Zach, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the bus trip up there because that was definitely a huge impression to everyone. You can see in the well, you can see in the uh, bottom left hand corner there the big green school bus. We can fit three or four pinballs in there pretty comfortably, and we haul them in and we take it wherever we need to take it. Uh, the Van Ann Arbor VFW where we got an Air Airbnb afterwards and just played pinball pretty much all night after playing pinball all day. Uh, <laughs> 
When we go into a couple weddings and just load pinballs in the back of the bus, take them with us. They're easy to get in and out. Everybody always has a good time with it. And then we also have a friend locally, uh, Nick, who does Northeast Ohio Pinball Network, and that's the streaming side of it. And I was came to an epiphany a little bit at the Ohio Championships last year where I'm watching it on my phone while someone else is trying to stream it through their phone. And these epic things are happening, like this battle back and forth, David versus Goliath sort of situation. I'm going, there has to be like better ways to do this. And there's so many great... Uh, streamers out there and Nick has picked up the baton in Ohio and just on his own dime built this rig and has been everywhere uh, streaming pinball and it's just so much better Ohio quality. State, Prusa, Ohio State yeah. champion yeah. Steve Prusa. But these are just a few photos here of our events. Obviously, as with anything, you want kids to be involved whenever possible because that's the next generation that's on the way. So getting kids involved in community events. Um, I'm heavily involved locally, Hoover Pinball League, um, and things like that to, to get people involved. We also do things uh, in schools, STEM events, science, things like that. <laughs> the community side of it, uh, I, a lot of the times people come out not only just to play the unique games or the weird games that we're bringing out or putting together, it's also just partially to come out and hang out with other like-minded people and talk about what's going on. You know, it, it, you can't just go out and play. It, it, it's to build, find like-minded people and hang out together. I think that is just as powerful as the game. Sure, you've got to bring the games, you've got to bring some unique stuff, but you also have to have a personality and, and, and want to interact with people and, and, and talk to them. I think that's the a big part of it is just the, the people want to get out and talk to other weirdos. I mean, we're all weird, so let's all hang out together and be weird. No, absolutely. I mean, Corbin is nailing it there. So when Corbin and I first started to collaborate on a lot of this stuff, we met through a location, Rack It Up Arcade. It was a new venue. How You guys had 20-ish 20, 20 pins in there? And they were doing a Wednesday league. Now, a lot of what we do isn't IFPA and like cutthroat tournaments and whatever else. It's literally a pinball club. It's school teachers and plumbers and architects and. I, I enjoy seeing all everybody come together for a common like you know people that wouldn't normally hang out together. We're all together now playing pinball. It's it's great. We're not talking religion. We're not talking politics. We're just oh, having we? a couple drinks. I've got some knocking opinions. Knocking a ball around and it's just the absolute best. <laughs> So, yeah, I think we're, we're moving from a spot where everybody was, you know, from the general public was saying, um, you know, pinball, that's something they still make, to yeah. pinball podcast, what do you talk about? And then, it, like, the door's already kind of opening now more, just among normal people in society. Yeah. So, um, the more people collectively we can bring in, I mean, you know, the, the rising weird tide is going to lift all of our ships, you know. Absolutely. Um, you know, so I'm not really competing myself with other podcasters. I listen to them, too. You know, listen to all of us. You know, the more listeners we have, the more we all benefit, too. Yeah, I mean, Don's absolutely nailing it. I mean, I could not have said it better. It's we should all be in this together. And that's part of what we do, part of what you guys do. Um, I mean, we have Andrew McBain in the audience now with Sasha, and they are <laughs> behind uh, Pinball Adventures. And literally, he's just, oh, hey, you know, I love pinball. I'm an enthusiast. And uh, here we go. Let's build a pinball machine. And his proof of concept is out there in the wild. We had one of the first machines, a Punny Factory engraved edition. And Corbin and his family were nice enough to allow me to tour it around Ohio and put it in their quarter up location. How Nobody else is doing interior graphics, interior gra and cabinet all graphics, all interior. full, dripping, love it. So definitely this will be like my social media spiel for a minute is follow Don's Pinball Podcast, follow Pinball Adventures, follow Angeli Stark Novelty, like get ingrained in this stuff because that's where all of the interesting content is, where you can find out about these weird things like Punny Factory to where you open the coin door and you look inside and you see there's an entire warehouse going on down here. The art doesn't end inside the game. It goes throughout the entire thing. Uh, we're just really, really fortunate to have gotten together. I mean, the way that, Don, talk a little bit about how you and I kind of first connected because that's an absolute wild story. Okay, so... I, I saw this game called Godzilla Premium. It was about a year and a half ago. And it was back 
time when every distributor had a year-long waiting list for this game. The 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 the, pr the price increase was coming up. The premiums were still like 8,500 back then. And you know, I'm looking everywhere for them. And then all of a sudden, this guy enters the chat on Facebook, and he's like, "If anybody wants a Godzilla premium new in box for MSRP, let me know." And I'm thinking immediately, this has got to be a scam. Scam. Scam alert. Scam, scam alert. I put this guy through the ringer, grilling him on questions. I checked with Stern <laughs> to make sure he was a listed <laughs> distributor, and then I still was a little bit uneasy you know but sure enough I, I put my deposit in we did the, the balance transfer and then the thing showed up in my driveway so and literally so I think it was right before Expo last year because it may have like been being delivered or arriving to your place like as you were coming to the show or something yeah, wild yeah, yeah so that was so he got me my Godzilla premium um, and and that was just just through chance on Facebook post I've been cut off oh there I'm back um, yeah, and so since then, um, you know, uh, in concert, I was also developing my podcast idea. Now that's going, and then I would just let people know when they're listening where I got my games from, and then that was benefiting him. And then he kindly started, you know, sending me T-shirts to give away. Now I do Friday live streams um, on Facebook, and I give two to three shirts away to just random people that are in the chat. And people love that. I love getting stuff for free. Who so doesn't figured... love free T-shirts? So... Speaking of which, if you don't already have one, there we go. We've got some shirts in the audience. We brought like 100 of the shirts that I'm wearing. So if you don't already have one before you leave, well, I have. Don, get one. Don, Don gets two probably because he's got to give some away on his Friday giveaways. <laughs> I, have another, I want to do a product toss at the end of this. We were talking about having a like a T-shirt launcher, but Mr. Burke said that you know there were some liability issues, and we might take out some you know some people. So we didn't do it after all. But next yeah. year, T-shirt catapult. T-shirt catapult. Outside. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess we'll, you know we'll wrap things up, but I definitely want to reemphasize our goal of positivity and pinball. Um, it's a community. It's something that we can all get on board with. But before I take any questions coming down the line, do you guys have any any additional notes or things that you want to get out there to the people? For the pop-up stuff, we just like to do the weirdest stuff possible. Like, you know, All the Bonds is a cool one. Uh, we're going to try to get all the Capcoms together next. Uh, that's on the list. Midnight Madness. I'm a crazy Midnight Madness fan. We're doing ha we got a lot of Halloween pop-up events coming up. Just bringing like Frankenstein, Scared Stiffs. We did all all three Elviras, the Unholy Trinity. Uh, I, just, I think the NBA Fast Break may have been one of oh, our I most about that. Yeah, yeah. successful ones, as yes. well as one of the ones that we had people who had no idea what pinball yes, was yes, that absolutely did, uh, had a blast. We've been touring linked. Yeah, we've been touring linked fast breaks because you can link them and play against each other. And so we, of course, found two and we're like, oh, let's take them around and go head to head. Bracket, you know, and it's just it's so much fun if you guys haven't seen it definitely check it out online it's you 1997 NBA fast break you can link the two together and go head to head but it's not who's trying to get the high score it's literally total number of points four quarters can go into overtime oh George Gomez my man linked and midnight madness oh, what my goodness yeah, but if you're not aware of Midnight Madness, check out latest episode, Fresh Pinball Podcast. We take a deep dive into that. We actually talked a little bit to uh, John Borg today about Monsters and Midnight Madness and all of that, so we hope to even get some more information. Anything for you to add there, Zach? I think we have really covered anything. Any questions? Oh, all right, right here. I mean, what's bigger right now than the NFL? I mean, billions of people and billions of people watch it, consume it, fantasy football, ESPN, you name it. I mean, no, I mean, even soccer. I mean, you know, European football, there, there are opportunities there. Flipper football, FIFA. I mean, the FIFA video game on, you know, PS5 and things like that are just, yeah, those are enormous. I think, you know, I don't want to speak out of school, but I would think the struggle on that would be, the license on that would be <laughs> probably pretty costly, mm -hmm. but maybe worth it. But that's absolutely, you are, we are missing out on some of those things, but there are definitely some opportunities there. And if we have to dig things out from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever we have to find in the archives, uh, we have great resources, great people who have worked together with us when we don't personally own the games, have loaned us games. When we did the Bond event, we didn't own uh, the Gottlieb version or the LE, so an operator out of Pittsburgh kindly lent us the games. Like, who does that? That's amazing. That's awesome.
We had a question over here. Is that a Loser Kids podcast? Oh, I like it. I've heard of them. <laughs> Very cool. Spotify. We're, once we get six episodes in, we'll go over to other platforms as well, but some of the platforms do have some requirements for content before we can proliferate to the others. But it's just a good time with some friends getting together, talking about pinball and anything else that are, uh, we may uh, think of at the time. I think we, was there a question right here? Yeah. So we measure that in a couple different ways. The, the biggest way is you know, the sales for Stern and our other manufacturing partners. Whenever they're expanding their production facilities, hiring at rates that they've never hired, not I shouldn't say never, but haven't hired at for you know, decades, that's how we measure it. Um, I mean, from an operator standpoint, uh, through the, I mean, we, I've, we've, our family's been doing it for almost 100 years, over 100 years. Four now. generations. Four generations. And it's like, you know, in late 90s, early 2000s, down. I mean, 2010, we got like laundromats. We got a couple you know, dive bars with some stuff <laughs> in it. We got a warehouse filled with pinballs just sitting on them all. Uh, and, and, and there was a time where people would ask, oh, what do you do? Oh, you know, I operate arcade games and whatnot. It's kind of a dying business. It's like, but then towards the late, you know, 15, 2015 and on, I mean, the the rise in it all has been crazy. Yeah, Co you know, it was going up, up, up. Then yeah, we have too many games on probably. <laughs> <laughs> But it, from an operator perspective, it absolutely is. I mean, the retro is cool again. Everybody loves it. it and we're just, you're seeing it in, in, in normal TV, in TV shows and movies. I mean, it's all, it, it, it's. It's back in back popular in culture in a way that it hasn't been for a long time. And I think the operator perspective, the distributor perspective, the manufacturer perspective, and then the media side of it, I mean, there's an appetite out there. And that's, yeah. that's our barometer for it. Unfortunately, Stern is a privately held company, so they don't share their production Release numbers. Production but numbers. I can tell you, they're, uh, they're cranking them out. I'd like to think that it's a trend because what we're seeing and what we are trying to develop is not just 40-year-old and 50-year-old dudes like me that are reliving their childhood but are passing it on to our kids, our teenagers, and things like that. So whenever they're making the, the leap then to having their own families, it's just a cycle. But it really comes down to people like Mr. Burke, myself, the Angelis, everyone to get out there and not just sell to the people who are already into it. It's growing, it's constantly growing, it engaging people into it. And I think the sky's the limit, it really is. I think, did we have a question over here in the Rush shirt? No? Are you excited for the, the 2012 to be on all the games now? You can play that, that wizard mode? Man, I love it, I love it. I just played it the other day, it's fantastic. Oh. So you have a Rush LE, LE yes. with oh, yeah. the topper? With the topper. Thank you, courtesy. So, so if you're not a Passion subscriber Ball. of Don's, like not only is he a podcaster, a content creator, he creates his own uh, mods. He, I mean, you did a topper for Elvira. That's insane. Yeah. I, Oh, the black and white Ooh, Elvira. So I talk saw about that this morning. I thought that was a terrible idea until I saw it, and now I, I want two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bought a I bought a, a Elvira premium, and I reskinned it to look like a 40th anniversary edition, um, which we gained mixed reactions online, <laughs> mostly positive, <laughs> but some people cut, took it as a personal affront. Um, right? Yeah, I want to link them together so we can go head to head. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There's definitely opportunities like that. Well, I think we're probably about at our time. Oh, we've got back. one back go. here, the, the young lady in the hat. Are there any pinballs you're looking to buy? Oh, that is a fantastic question. So one of the oh. things that, that we always talk about on the podcast is Big Bang Bar. We're looking for email, freshpinball at gmail.com. Maybe a Congo would be a nice one. That's the final Midnight Madness game that Corbin and his family Congo's are looking. Congo's fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Those would probably be the top two, but... Yeah, absolutely. There are, we're always looking, you know, basements, warehouses, you name it. We're looking for some pinball. But all, thank you. Thank you all so much for the time. Again, if you haven't already gotten a shirt, uh, meet me at the doorway, and I'll be happy to get you guys some shirts. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.